Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. We're glad that you're here. We're in the book of Mark, chapter number 8. So put your ribbon. How many of you got a ribbon in your Bible? Uh, put that in there. Uh, we had a friend of ours named Dave. He was a pastor. He was kind of half funny all the time. And he always said that little hangy down thing in your Bible. I mean, you, you remember that when we'd go to camp. Guys, you'd always had that in there. He said he put two of those in his Bible so he could look at two places with them on it. In the book of Mark, we've covered quite a bit for the first time in chapter 8. First time, the Lord changes direction in his ministry. And as he goes from his hometown to the locality to the widespread area, and he's working his way toward Jerusalem, each group rejects him as he goes down. And for the first time in chapter number 8, Mark, he tells the disciples something they did not know. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, that's where I'm headed to, and I'm going to be crucified there, buried and raised again the third day. None of them ever got it. They just didn't get it, okay? Um, you say, well, how could, how could that be? Uh, because we're all human. How many people do you know that raised from the dead? They knew he could raise other people from the dead because he had raised up Lazarus. But not many people can raise themselves from the dead. Remember, remember one of the great pictures? Here's a question for you to answer. There was one of the ladies in the book of Acts who died. And because so many old ladies were saying, she made our clothes and she helped us work and she did all this. And now she's died. What are we going to do? Well, they raised her up. She, God raised her back up from the dead. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? Dorcas. Dorcas. Oh, so, I guess God cares about old ladies a lot, right? So, you know, come back. She might have died because she got tired of making stuff for old ladies. So I don't know. But, but either way, it's where it went through. But in that, when, when he gets to the place, we talked about that yesterday, I mean last week, that when he tells them, and here's what he says, he began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders, because that's where he's got to go. He, if he's the Lamb of God, who offers the Passover Lamb? The high priest. They have to be the ones, the last ones, to reject him. And they turn him over to the slaughterer. It has to be biblical. On the cross, they broke the legs of the two, but the, the Passover lamb, the strict rule was not a bone of him to be broken, and neither was they of the Lord. They never broke any bone. So, in that, that causes a little bit of contention some places. But he said, and the chief priest and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Well, you remember what happened? Peter jumped up and said, no way, I'm not going to let you do that. I bet you, I bet you, there's probably more people here in the room today who would be just like Peter. And I often tell a little bit about being in Jerusalem and being there where they had the carved out feet where they had the Lord. Those are still there. When they played that wicked game with him, you know, the blindfold him and whichever way he stumbled, they did whatever thing that with that lifeline thing, you know, beating him or you know, whatever happened to him, all the stuff. I couldn't stand it in there. I left, I left and took off and that was the first time I was ever there. And uh, the tour guide came out and said, are you okay? I said, yeah. And it kind of, because if I'd have been there, it had to kill me first. Just like Peter. He never gave up on that. <coughs> they had to kill me first. And I'd be doing exactly opposite of what the Lord wanted me to do. If you don't understand that, you wouldn't make a very good warrior at all. Peter, come, they come out to arrest the Lord, and everybody, the Talmud, almost every Jewish, they said there was at least 500 of them. Peter's no coward. He pulls out a sword. He's going to fight them all. All 500 of them. 
And he don't even hesitate. He cuts off a guy's ear right to start with. But the Lord made him quit. That's a puzzle. Can, I, I guarantee you, he couldn't figure that. That's not what we ought to do. But see, that's, that's the difference in the Lord offering himself and, and us protecting people that aren't, that are just normal. They have one life they will build. The Lord knew what he was doing. But he had to be offered by those people. So he goes down. He's telling them where he's going. Peter jumps up, and, and the Lord finally told him, you're acting like the devil. And now you go back to the temptation of the Lord, and that's what the devil did. He said, I'll give you, you want all the kingdoms of the world? I'll give them to you if you'll just worship me. Well, would he kept his word? I, I don't think so. He never has kept his word. But if he had, he could have got all the kingdoms, but he couldn't have got us because he had to die. To get us. If he'd have taken that, there would have been no saved people in the whole world, and all the people who had died would be hopeless. But he didn't. And he tells Peter in, in, in kind of a roundabout way, get thee behind me. That's what Satan did. Satan. He's not calling Peter Satan. He said, You're just acting like him. All right. My mom and dad always, when they'd get mad at me, one of them would say, my mom would say, you act just like your father. And my dad would say, you act just like your mother. They stayed together for almost 50 years, so I guess they liked each other a little bit. All right? In verse 34, we start out with a whole new deal here. The necessity of trust in Jesus as your Savior. <clears throat> I might should have said, and Lord, because of the way it's written. There's a difference between knowing Christ as your Savior. Many are called, though, and few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. What's that mean? Preachers always turn that around. They said, there are many are cold, but a few are just frozen. You know? What's it mean, many are called, and few are chosen? Not, not everybody that starts out. How many of them came to the Lord and said, Lord, I want to follow you? And he'd say, I don't have a place to live. I don't have a place to sleep. It's going to cost you this and this and this. And take up your cross and follow me and all that. And they go, woo. And Luke, he said, you put your hand to the plow and turn back. You're not fit for the kingdom. Didn't say you don't get to go. Just said you're just not fit for it. Of all the people in the whole world, what do you think the percentage are of the folks who know Christ compared with them as Savior? compared to those who serve Him as Lord. It's, it's a big difference. Okay? Statistically, I don't know about everything because we don't keep statistics on everything. Statistically, 90% uh, of the people who know Christ as Savior never do anything to reach anybody else. They don't give to missions. They don't pass out tracts. They don't talk to anybody. They don't mention the Lord. They don't bring people to church. So less than 10% of the people who know the Lord do that. That seems odd to me. You know what I mean? I got saved. I wanted, I wanted the whole world to know. Started telling everybody. They thought I was crazy, which I am. All right? Make it bigger. Now make it bigger? Sure. Always, Everybody's always wanting something. You know what? Will that help you? <laughs> Look what he said. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And someday I'm going to preach you a message about if you're going to, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. I don't, I don't care what you say. It's going to cost you something. You say, well, I know people that trusted the Lord and their life just went well. And hey, I'm one of those people. But it cost you something. To serve the Lord. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, that includes not just the Lord, but the Gospels would be the spreading of it, right? The same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's knowing Jesus. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? And now to me, that means what would I give up for 
my salvation? Well, nothing. It, it, would any amount of money or any kind of time or any amount of effort be worth the trade? No. So evidently, to me, immediately from after being saved, I, I figured, you know what? That means the whole world. If I'm that important, so are they. So we start talking to them. For whosoever therefore shall be ashamed, now watch this, ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. He's talking about being in the world. If you're ashamed of the Lord in the world, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Two things you can grab real quick out of here. Number one, you're there. Because the only prerequisite of going to be with the Lord is you know him as your personal Savior. It never does say you have to serve him with your life, give tithes, win other people to Jesus, read your Bible, act good, none of that stuff. It's if you know Christ is your personal Savior. I, those of you, listen, I, and there are a lot of things I've learned from losing a kid. Okay? She's just a tiny little infant girl, just a couple, not very old at all. And you've heard me talk about sitting by the bed saying, Lord, can I have her? And him, uh, he told me no. And she passed away. And she's buried in Melbourne, Florida. She never done anything. She didn't work. She didn't send me Father's Day cards. She didn't. She never hugged me. She never did any of that stuff. But she's mine. She's that by birth. And when you're born again, you're the Lord's by birth. Now, I know a lot of you guys have perfect kids. I mean, they're absolutely perfect. I know a lot of people who are absolute liars too, but anyhow, I don't care what my kids do, they're still my kids whether they please me or don't. And you get over that. What do you say? When, when you're there, he, you're going to be there whether you served him or not because you didn't get there by doing good things or bad things. You got there because you trusted him as your personal Savior, period. We're saved by grace. Service is an act of faith, okay, because you won't do it without the faith in the Lord. But when, when you trusted him as personal Savior, I didn't have a clue what that meant. All I knew is that there was a promise for me that I wouldn't go to hell if I trusted him as Savior, and I did, and I meant it, and he did. All the other stuff is according to what you want to do later. But he said this, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, when is that? That's a long time after most of us got saved. Now, we're going to talk about that today a little bit in church. There's a whole bunch of things set out for us. In the New Testament, there are seven judgments listed. And one of those judgments is the judgment of the saved people. Now, get that really quick. The judgments of the saved people. Paul said in Corinthians, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us saved people. If you got this, this, and this, and this, you get a reward. And you, you know what you get to do with the reward? You get to give it to the Lord. He said, but if all everything you have is wood, hay, and stubble gets burnt up, nevertheless, you're saved, yet so it by fire. Irrelevant point. Your salvation and service are two different things. You've got to get them apart. Okay? They're totally different. Know the Lord is your Savior, you're saved. He saves us by grace, didn't take any work. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. Paul calls the Galatians foolish because they tried to put the two together. And they, they don't go together. And so that's a wonderful thing, all right? I had a, at a preacher's meeting one time, uh, the preacher preached a message, and I disagreed with him. And after church, after the meeting, we're standing around, and I disagreed with him about service. He said, if you don't have fruit in your lifetime, you're not saved. I have exception with that. 
And I said, you know, we're talking. And he, he went on and on and on. And after the deal, he came out and he was talking a little bit. And he said, I said, well, I disagree with that. And he goes, well, that's because, you know, when you get more mature in the Lord, you'll understand. I, you know, guys, <clears throat> Cheryl and I both are, are a lot alike in a lot of ways. Both of us can kill more plants than you can shake a stick at. Okay? And uh, if I ever tried to cultivate weeds, they'd probably all die. Maybe that's what I need to do. But there's one thing I can do, and I like doing it, and my mom did. My mom and dad loved to plant trees. They plant. They start with the, with the, whatever seed, a pecan or whatever, and walnut or whatever. And uh, and I was telling them, I said, well, okay, never mind. I said, you know, I got, uh, I planted uh, down at one of my family's house. I had these pecan trees, and I went down and picked up a whole handful and planted like 24, 25 of them. Part of some of you guys got those after they got bigger, put them in coffee cans. They got about six or eight inches tall. And then I planted two of them in my backyard and they're about 35 or 40 feet high now. Okay. And I said, you know, I've, I planted some pecans and I'm growing trees, but I don't know what kind of trees they are. And the same preacher said, why not? I said, because. It takes it take a pecan normally is five to six years old before it starts bearing fruit. And I said, I, I won't know what kind of tree it is until it bears the fruit. And he said, George, that's stupid. If it's a pecan tree, it's a pecan tree, whether it has fruit or not. I said, you're kidding me. And he went, oh, I knew that was a trick thing. If it never bears, if you planted that pecan tree in the middle of a hundred thousand acres and there wasn't another pecan tree for a hundred thousand, would it still be, it, it would never bear fruit. It has to have a second one out there, right? Would it still be a pecan tree? Yeah. Fruit and what you are and what you, what you bear are two different things. You get that? You notice I'm really adamant about that, okay? Here's the part I want you to see, though. There's going to be a come a time. And don't tell me you ever had a kid. You don't know this. He said, wherefore, who shall be ashamed of me in this world? He said, I'm going to be ashamed of them. Doesn't mean he, you're not his, all the them. Means he hates you, right? No. Nah. I'm, I'm telling you, in my lifetime, I promise you, there was a couple of times, maybe more than a couple, that my mother and father were kind of ashamed to know that I was theirs. Mm. We can have a testimony of the wrong kind of stuff. My, my dad had a testimony as the nicest, kindest, loving, caring in, guy in the whole county. I was his boy. I didn't have that one. Didn't have that kind of testimony. He wasn't saved. You should have seen what happened to him after he got saved. But he was that kind of guy. I, I bet they didn't brag on me a whole lot. What do you want to bet? You ought to see what George has done now. Most of the time they go, what did George do now? Okay. All right. It's just part of what goes on. But I'm still theirs. And I'm pretty sure that probably broke my mom's heart two or three different times. All right. My favorite story about that, though, was I never started a fight. They always broke out around me. Did, do, how many of y'all were like that through school and every place else? They just, you'd just be standing there and a fight would break out and you had to defend yourself or something. And I got put out of school two or three times in a couple of weeks and mom told me if next time they got out, she was going to make sure my father took care of it. So they called her that afternoon, told her that she had to come and get me out of school because I was fighting. So she got, I got in the car. She said, your dad's going to kill you because I'm going to make sure he just takes care of this, you know. So what was you fighting about anyhow? I said, you know, last week when you had to come up and get me, Mama, this is my favorite thing. She said, yes. I said, one of the boys who saw you today told me that my mama was a fat woman. And when he told me my mom was a fat woman, I punched him in the face. 
She said, well, we won't tell your dad this time, okay? <laughs> I, can you imagine, though, the amount of things that brought into her life? I can't, you know, never thought about it. Doesn't mean she didn't claim me. Matter of fact, she lied. My mother was a liar. Because I introduced Cheryl to her the first time, and she said, Oh, George never did anything wrong his whole life. I said, You a lot. What's wrong with you, Courtney? <laughs> Actually, I said, She's marrying me, Mom, not Chuck. Okay, so, anyway. but that she's just trying to get rid of me. She's afraid she wouldn't take me. But you understand in all this stuff that even the Lord has the desire to be proud of you, or, and, and if you can do that, you can have the, the ability to go the other extreme. I think we do things in this life that makes the Lord cringe sometimes about His. We're still His. I don't want to be that. I want to be that one that pleases the Lord here and also there. Now, I don't know how far back I'm going to be in line, but um, people have done some great, great, wonderful things for the Lord. We're just talking about one of our missionaries Brother Corey, he's our missionary of the month. I, I know he's lost sons, and he's been injured, and his brother was murdered, and all because the Muslims where he's at often raid their churches and come in and shoot the place up and kill people. And I, I haven't had to anybody here had to do that. Me, I haven't had to do that. I haven't had to suffer that. It's hard, and he stays faithful in what he's doing. Just got a letter from him saying he's taking his people over to the, to the Jordan River, which is, he, he's in uh, Bethlehem, and he's going all the way to the Jordan River, which is a good ways, okay, to baptize, because they have those special baptism places over there. And while he was over there, a whole bunch of people from, who was talking about that letter this morning with me? Was it France? The king? Yeah. South Africa, a whole bunch of South Africans that knew the Lord as Savior and went, had nobody to baptize them. They asked him if he could baptize them since he was a preacher. So he baptized all these South Africans that were there on tour, Michael. They, were praying that somebody they, they had been praying that, that somebody that would be, would be the right kind of guy come in. So he talked to them all and baptized all of them, sent them on home. Now they can start a church, right? One of them would call them out. So, but... To do that, where he's at, just for the person, is a big step of faith. Because it's going to cost them something. And to publicly announce, hey, I'm, I'm born again, I'm a Christian now. A lot of them lose their family, and they lose their jobs, and they lose their... See, that's a bit... I, I, anybody had to suffer that as an American? I say, we don't do that, you know. But worst thing I ever had in my life is when I got saved, all the people who weren't good for my life left me, which turned out to be a blessing. Right? There's the ability to be ashamed of the Lord. Now, now I'm going to do a couple something. There's Matthew, says the same thing, doesn't change it. And this one I like. Now, Mark, Luke, and John excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, because they're kind of a lot alike. John's nothing like that. So it's not one of the synoptic Gospels. So that's a real religious word. It means similar, like a synonym. They, they are similar. They all pretty much say the same thing. In Matthew chapter 9, turn back over here with me. Matthew chapter 9. He says something. At the end of this same portion of Scripture, he says something. He gives them this great prophecy. Seven, eight, nine. <clears throat> he says something. Verse number one. Matthew, Mark chapter nine, I mean, but I want you to go to Matthew uh, 16. I said nine, didn't I? Matthew 16. If you go down through this, He's going to tell you, verse number 28, the last verse, 
a neat thing about the disciples, at least three of them. Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now Mark and Luke, it's in the next chapter. But before you get all hyper, okay, and you start, I had a guy explain one time, well, Luke did it because he's trying to explain it. I don't remember exactly when Charles Usher put the, the chapter breaks in. Does anybody know for sure? Okay, but it's been within the last seven or eight hundred years, seven hundred years, probably less than that. Some guy went through here and he divided up the whole Bible in verses and chapters, which it never was before. We just put them in there. And instead of being like all the apostles, it never does say, for the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 14 says, because there wasn't any chapter 6, verse 14. There was no chapters. There was no verse markings. There was no sentence structure. In, in all the Greek manuscripts, next time you're telling me about Greek manuscripts and how much you know, they had... No spaces. They just wrote it and wrote it and wrote it and wrote it. And actually, the all the way down through the first copies of the 1611, it didn't have all that in it, in the first editions of them. Can you imagine reading that? And I'd say, hey, Richard, turn over with me somewhere in the book of Isaiah. You'd have to read the whole book of Isaiah again and pretty much know, but to be able to find a place. But now, whether they're right or wrong, which I think they divide up a whole lot of them wrong, irrelevant point. They're not inspired. That throws you, don't it? That the chapters and verses aren't inspired. We just added them so I could say, Richard, turn to Matthew chapter 17, or turn to Matthew chapter 16, or turn to and look at verse 28, and he goes, what? He can just go, okay, got it, and do it. And there we are. Isn't that cool if somebody thought of that for us? You know what else it inspired? The dates at the top of the book. Another Charles Usher, that's why they're called Usher dates. They're really, really, really good guesses. He's pretty smart. You ever read The Annals of History by Charles Usher? It's a book about the size, of, half the size of this table. And it's about this thick, and the print must be like number six or seven in it. And it's got everything you could ever think about, any place or any stuff in all kinds of history. And the man was an amazing specimen of humanity. He knew history. I get it down sometimes and just read it. It's a great big old book, ain't it, sure? I mean, it's just wide, this tall, about that thick, little tiny print in it. Everything you'd ever want to know about Cleopatra, how she was hooked it up by your Bible, talks about Cleopatra in the book of Daniel. A couple of other places. She's queen of the South, you know. At least she's from the South, right? You guys have no sense of humor at all. Hmm. Right. There's, but he's the one that put the dates in it. And you see up in the top, mine says A.D. 32. That's a, you know, it's not absolutely accurate. You understand that? How do you know? Well, come on. A.D. 32. Maybe the time it is, but it's not the right year because if we use our calendar... A guy died after Jesus was born and went down to Egypt. Who was it that died? Herod. Herod! Woo -hoo! Give the man a candy bar. Herod the Great. He died in, according to our calendar, he died before Jesus was born because it would have been B.C. 4. The calendar's off, okay? 
Can you believe that? Since you don't know where to start, how, if you were there, what would you do? They say, well, you know, it's B.C. Would you buy a coin from me if I had it stamped, if it was stamped B.C. 27? Huh, would you? I'll sell it to you for a thousand bucks. Because I wish you would, because, you know, if you ever find one of those, it's a fake because nobody knew that. You can't have a B.C. until you had an A.D. We made that up. That helps us no time. We have 365 days in a year, but not really. Because we got a fourth of a day and we add it every four years. Hopefully, straighten stuff out a little bit for us. Because that's the way we tell time. That's the way we tell months. And that's the way we tell years. They added, have y'all, have I ever told y'all that in all these 40 years of being with you that, that the chapter divisions and then they went through, if you get your, if you have an anti-King James person, they'll tell you that there's been like 11,000 changes in the, from the original 1611. There, there has. They put census in there. They started everyone with a capital. They changed the spelling and the words that were spelled wrong. There's one by one. There's one that slipped by them. It's in the Old Testament. Find it. One word. It slipped by and it stayed in there all these years in the text. There wasn't any. Can you imagine reading Matthew and it's just the same letters, same thing, no break, no spot, between, and it never stops. Look at Matthew chapter 17. You're there. Look at the first part. It's chapter 17, verse 1. See it? So you can find it. Watch. And, after six days, verse 2, and, ready? verse 3, and, verse 6, and, and verse 7, and, and verse 8, and, and verse 9, and, and verse 10, and, and. That's just what it went. And, 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 and. No commas, no periods, no punctuation. Aren't you glad somebody before you helped you out a little bit? I am. I would have had a hard time with that. Now you say, why did you do that? Because, because those things are not inspired. Sometimes the chapter and verses are wrong. <gasps> Amazing the number of people that they'll, they'll believe the scripture's wrong, but they can't believe the chapter numbers are wrong. That's heresy. Burn the preacher. All right. You say, why did you do that? Because if you look at it, Matthew chapter seven, uh, 16 puts it right after that statement he made about the angels and him being ashamed and coming back. He makes a statement about these guys standing here. And he says, There shall some be standing here which shall not taste of death till they'll see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. Some means how many? Some means what? What? More than one. The coolest thing about all this is that everybody knew and understood about John. But what they didn't get was about James and Peter. Because the three in the sum is James and John and Peter. They get to see the end. When you get over the book of John, or in the book of John, Peter gets upset because Jesus tells him, I'll, I'll get this to you next week, okay? He gets upset because Jesus tells him he's going to be crucified and die. And he turns to John, because they all know it's John. What about this man? How come I have to die and he gets to live forever? That's a pretty good question, Richard. Amen? And John tells him, you don't get to live forever. I'll cover you with the verses next week, okay? He just said, I would get to see the end. And John got to see the end. 
because he wrote the revelation. And then he died. Because it's appointed unto men once to die. But Peter thought that. You say, well, what did he answer Peter? It, it must be one of the greatest things. You know, I've had great answers in my lifetime. In my, I ask people questions and they give you great answers. What are these things doing here? And somebody say, they're not here and neither are you. Oh, yeah. I just remembered I'm not here either. Isn't that a great answer? Neither are you. Jesus said, what is that to you? How come I got to die and he gets to live forever? What is that to you? Peter figures it out later. I promise you, he figures it out before he dies. He figures it out. But there, I'm going to explain that to you next week. Now, back in Mark and over in the book of Luke, chapter number 9, verse 27, it's in the next chapter. Both of them are. Have no, it has nothing to do with when it happened. It all happens. See the next word, the first word in Mark, chapter 9, and... It's right behind whatever he just said. And. And. It goes along with it. And it's there. There's also a problem, if you think it's a problem, and I want you to figure it out. This is your whole job for the week. You ready? Matthew and Mark both say, verse 2 of chapter 9 says, and after six days, Jesus taketh with him. Mark says eight days. Your job is this week in your homework to figure out why Mark would say one thing, Matthew would agree with him, but Luke adds two days to it. Anybody up to it? Come on. A different millennium? No. Yeah, we, well, that's a good. Okay, and what you're doing, what you got. But there's there's not really a discrepancy there, okay? That's kind of like when you read through the Old Testament and David was this old when they anointed him king and then he was this old when they anointed him king and then, in, you know, there's this on Samuel, he's one age when he's in, two, actually gets two in Samuel and then he gets one in Kings and one in Second Kings and they're all different. Well, he got anointed three times king once when he was just a kid Samuel came out and anointed and he went back to keeping sheep then when he got to be king he got anointed but it was only Judah and uh, Benjamin then the next time he gets anointed he's Judah and Benjamin and the other ten tribes so there's really not a problem with that you, you understand that not a problem at all in, in any of that it's just figuring it all out you know, there, there are some things that I probably can't answer except rationally. Uh, most everybody I know through Bible college had a hard time with the number of people that were on the ship with Paul when they're on the way to Rome. Because all, you know, that there's too many people to be on that ship. They're all a bunch of slaves going to die. Since when did they worry about how many people, too many people, slaves being in a cargo hold? If some of them dies, it just gave you more room. There, there's no, uh, come on. We, we're always fussing about that and thinking about all those things, that atrocious things that they did in slave ships. What makes you think that the Romans were nicer? You think they had berths and had a bathroom room and stuff in there? They're all crowded down there in chains. You say, well, how do you know that? I, I just don't, I don't know the number. I'm just going to have to go with the number. But then you don't either, so we'll go with the number. There's, I haven't, I haven't found a number problem in all the scripture, as far as that. And ne neither will you in that. And I like to bring it to your attention because I want you to think. How many of you are going to work on that this week? I got one. There you go. You got two of you. You know, work the rest of them. Going, I'm going to wait till next week to see what you say. Amen. That's a safe way to do it, right? But concerning it, but I'll, I'll give you a hint. 
And you can read the next part of this chapter of what happens, okay? And I'm, I'm going to explain to you what that transfiguration was all about. And that's how come those verses come in that order. And the Lord puts it in order. And every one of them, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, get it in that exact same order, no matter where somebody else put the verse, what chapter they put it in. It's not a division. It still goes on. So when you read your Bible, if you don't get anything else out of today, read a little bit into the last chapter and read some from the chapter before that to the next chapter to be able to see. Because some this because there's a division there don't mean there's a division in the thought or what goes on with it. We, we put, somebody else put those in there. And boy, am I glad because I can find it. How many of you can quote John 3.16? How many of you could find it if there weren't chapters and verse numbers? You couldn't. We, we wouldn't know what you was talking about. Somebody quote me the verse in John, and Bob would have the verse, and you would have one, and to see, I, and I can preach to you in church. I'm, I'm glad God allowed that. And say, this is the verse, and you can look it up in your Bible. Got a question? This is a Bible study. You should ask questions. Anybody got a question? No? This is where we're going. And that's where we're headed off to. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. That he's going, all these things are going to happen. We covered that in James and John. They had a hard time understanding this. He began to teach them that he was going to go be killed. When he goes up on the mount, as they came down from the mountain, he charged them they would tell no man what things they seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. Now look at verse 10. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another, what the rising of the dead should mean. What does that mean? I don't think I'd have any problem believing that I'd be just like them because it's always easy to look back and say, huh, I should, you should have grabbed that because I know everything in between. They did not. Even when the Lord was crucified and rose again, and Mary Magdalene came to them and said, I saw the Lord and He's alive. And they said, what? She was like somebody that told a story. Thomas would say, I'm not going to believe it till I can stick my finger in his hands and put my fist in his side. The rest of them were believers because Jesus showed up. What if you don't ever get to see? That, that amazes me. The number of people want one to the with no background, no understanding of all that stuff. And the only reference I have to it is me. First time I heard the gospel, 20 years old, never had a clue what it meant. Absolute faith. This is what the preacher said, showed it to me from the book, and I believed it. Didn't have a clue about anything else and whatever else it meant. Matter of fact, the first time I started teaching a class, we said, let's teach in Genesis. And I figured out something, you know, that God put enmity between the woman and the serpent. I grew up in North Florida, right by the Okie Finoki Swamp. Everybody there didn't like snakes. And that must be an ingrown thing, right? Had nothing to do with the snake, did it? Had to do with the man and the woman and the devil. But in my little mind, I remember thinking, this will be easy. That's why you got to learn the difference between a rat snake and a rattlesnake. Right? So you know which one to be scared of. Hmm? Cheryl, is like, Cheryl is like a friend of mine that was a, I work with. He was an older gentleman. He said, there's only two kinds of snakes in the world. Live ones and dead ones, and both of them will hurt you. That's not true. 
but that's the way it goes. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for being able to study the word of God. And Lord, there's every answer for everything that we need in this life is in the word of God. And yet, Lord, we're very hesitant sometimes to believe it. We'll just check Google. Lord, I ask you to depend on the things you've shown us, Lord, especially our eternity, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.